It's white to play in this position. Maroxi with the white pieces. Can you find the invisible move that was found by Maroxi in this position? The only move that wins for white in this position is an invisible move to a human eye. Today, folks, I'm talking about a beautiful book. The title is Invisible Chess Moves. It's written by Neyman and Afek. That book is a beautiful one for a couple of reasons. As a cognitive scientist, the book has claims on certain aspects of chess moves that are invisible to a human eye. The humans have cognitive biases geometrically or for other reasons, some moves on a chessboard are especially more difficult for us humans to spot. And that's a basic claim of that book. They have different chapters, different positions, beautiful selections that we really, really test for the skill of forcing ourselves to spot those invisible moves. It's good for creativity. It's good for observing those patterns and understanding our blind spots. Talking about this position, white to play. It looks like we are in trouble because we are down a piece. Black has an extra bishop, you see. Well, our queen is attacked. And you see the alignment on the h-file? If the queen moves somewhere, let's say to g5, then you invite rook takes h3 check, and then queen d4 check, and you get mated, basically. White seems to be in trouble in the beginning position, folks. This rook is guarded by the queen on b2. You don't have any meaningful check to give right now to the black king. It looks like we are busted, because if the queen moves, then the game is over. So, I'm giving you a second chance right now, folks. What are you seeing? Can you see this pawn on e7? That's an advanced pass pawn. That's our advantage, of course. And maybe now you start to spot some interesting resources for white. Obviously, we should check the most forcing move first. This rook g8 check is the most forcing move. But if you start with the move rook g8, it doesn't work because they will capture on g8. And yes, you can give this little check on h5. But after king d7, it's not mate. It's not mate. You're making a queen, but the king is surviving to c7. Black has an extra bishop. And after, let's say, rook e7 check, king b8, or queen e7 check, bishop d7, there are no meaningful checks left for us. And they just win the position with an extra bishop. You see? So rook g8 check also doesn't work. So we're sort of in an impasse, right? It looks like nothing is working. Should we resign? Should we look at then all possible moves, even impossible ones? Okay, folks? Now, the final point is, of course, this rook needs to guard the 8th rank in so many lines, right? You see, if the rook would not be here, then rook g8 check would become an option, followed by promotion, of course. Thus, can we place the queen somewhere useful to prevent rook h3 check, but also maybe to eye the black king on e8? And that was my final prompt to you, and you're a great player if you found Maroxi's move, queen h5. Completely invisible backward queen move, the only move that wins the game. What a beautiful one this is, right? First of all, backward moves in chess is generally more difficult to spot, right? Is a human. There is no scientific study on this yet, but I heard from several coaches, also from my own observations, it's difficult to spot such moves when it's like, especially like a queen retreat that also attacks something. Plus, what is this? I mean, it looks like it's a blunder, right? Well, what if they just take our queen? That's the final difficulty of spotting this move as a candidate at all. Well, if they take our queen, folks, you tell me. Rook g8 check, followed by e8 equals queen, followed by take on h5, and no threats are there. Rook h3s are gone. White has an extra exchange with a winning position. Your king is very safe, right? So that's the first point of queen h5. This queen is immune, basically. What's the final point of queen h5? The queen is eyeing the black king. White's introducing all kind of discovered attacks against the black king. And maybe more importantly, you're stopping the move rook takes h3 check. You're still blocking that rook's access to h3. One difficulty of an invisible move, folks, are they are very difficult to spot. But once you see them on the board, everything looks so obvious, right? Once I break down this move to you, you may, might be telling yourself, how come I missed that? Yes, it was so obvious, right? Obviously, everyone can see all the point behind this move. But they are so difficult to spot in an actual game. 
So that's the final benefit of this book because it really forces us to push our limits of creativity and actively search for those difficult moves. So that's how the real game ended, folks. Queen h5, black player tried rook takes g2 check, rook takes g2. It's very good that they're attacking the enemy queen on b2 and there are no counter checks. Thus, rook h5, rook b2. Notice that there is no rook g8 right now because the queen is pinning our rook, but that's good enough. Black wins the pawn on h3, but you see, please take a step back. White has an extra exchange with a completely winning advantage, also because of the advanced pawn on a7. That's how Maroxi won the game, folks. He, he offered an exchange of the rooks, improved his rook, and this comes with this check, this check, and of course, Black resigned because after this comes this move, and I win your rook. Otherwise, anything is winning for us. This followed by this. White has a winning advantage. Folks, that's the first interesting moment. Queen h5. Invisible looking queen retreat, a little move on an open file. Now I will show you a very relevant and similar example. This is a chess classic. Ulf Anderson versus Mestel. Mestel with the black pieces missed this move. There's a winning move for black, there is an invisible move. Take a stock. Black is down an exchange right now, so black needs to play actively in this position. I want you to take a stock. Look at the big picture. And maybe you can come up with a move that is just directly winning. Once I put it on the board, it will become so obvious to you. But can you spot it? Folks, it's very similar to the last example. There's an open file and there's tension between those heavy pieces. I want you to generate little option for yourself, right? Also, can you see this little weakness on G2? This pawn is attacked once and guarded only once by the white king. Can we somehow put pressure on that pawn in this case? You also see that this queen is putting pressure on the rook only one. This rook is loose because attacked once and guard only once. So that's my final prompt to you. There's a loose pawn on g2 and a loose rook on e1. Can you combine these two factors and find the move? You're a great player if you found the move rook d2. <laughs> Completely an invisible move, but once it's on the board, I'm sure you'll understand the effect of this move. First things first, we are creating a mate in one threat with queen takes g2. Is that right? White has no natural way to defend against this threat. That's correct. There's a single check on e8, but after king h7, your checks are running out and we still are having the same problems, right? Rook d2. What if they take on d2? Now becomes obvious. This comes with check followed by picking up the rook on d2, there are no discovered check, there are no perpetual checks, nothing. And black is winning this position. After rook d2, well, almost feels like there are no lines to calculate, right? Because, I mean, the game is completely over. Rook e2 doesn't work because of this as well. So, once I put on the board, it becomes so obvious that black is completely winning this position. The machine is giving us the best line as queen e8 check followed by rook takes d2. There is nothing else. You're losing your rook, and the game is lost. The problem for Mestel was even to spot this move as a candidate. John Nunn said, they are very especially difficult moves to find. If you make a heavy piece move on open file and you're not capturing the end piece, right? If you're just dropping your piece in the mid base, so to speak, like a mouse slip. Oh my God, mouse slip. I, I intended rook d1, but my mouse slipped and I played the move rook d2. Turns out to be an amazingly beautiful move, right? Something like this is going on psychologically. People don't spot such moves. Also makes sense because 99.9% .9 of the time, such moves are just a mouse slip, right? Just basic blunders. But sometimes they are game-winning, beautiful moves that you can tell to your grandchildren. So by going through these examples, we are opening up our minds to such options. In this case, I also, of course, right, break it down to you that there was a problem on g2, this rook is already loose, so there are some contours in the position that strengthens, let's say, this idea of rook t2, right? Rook t2, in fact, creates a mate in one threat, and in, in some sense, that's a very forcing move that should be calculated, right? Because generating a mate in one threat is the second most forcing move in chess. So purely from that practice of looking at every single forcing move, then maybe we should also spend some time in this move, rook d2. I think in the actual game, Mestel played the move rook d5, which is a much more human move, right? Because we want to, let's say, 
capture back on d5 if they take well they cannot even take because that guy is hanging with check so mestel sort of improved his rook and he stopped the threat of rook takes d5 this way right but that rook little bit fall too short in that open file and he missed the chance to win this position in fact white has a winning advantage right now with an extra exchange another position from the book now it's a defensive exercise white to play please take a stock white has two extra pieces right now right two extra pieces but it looks like our king is busted just please take a stock the first threat is queen h3 mate if you take the bishop nothing changes queen h3 is mate it looks like white pieces are sleeping they are not in a position to defend against the threat on h3 if you move your rook then you get mated on g2 right so it looks like there is no natural move left for white to fight then you start looking at some forcing moves bishop takes h7 check king h7 queen c2 you want to guard the second rank like that but then black will play bishop e4 a beautiful move and you're totally busted queen h4 mate cannot be stopped you have to give up your queen and the game is totally lost in this position so no natural moves are saving us knight e7 checking h8 there is no next move right nothing changes you're still faced with these enormous threats and you're lost so it looks like we're about to resign right but i want you to stop resigning check for all resources exhaust all options can you see folks the alignment on the g file this chapter is beautiful because it talks about alignment on a certain file that contains so many important pieces for example queen and king are aligned on the g file together with your rook right tactically alignment is always the key alignments play a huge role in chess tactics so this example drills that beautifully folks i want you to look, look deeper be creative and find that resource for white that takes advantage of this potential problem for black his king and queen are aligned on the g file can we exploit that and you're a great player if you found the move queen h6 completely invisible disgusting looking move that wins the game queen h6 stops queen h4 and queen h3 threats these were the threats we had to be careful about right that's clear but what if they take our queen are we crazy and now you see the point of the alignment right g takes f3 and this queen is pinned and we picked up on the next turn white is winning with so much extra material please take a stock folks white has three minor pieces for a rook with a completely winning material advantage again once you see queen h6 on the board everything becomes obvious there are no lines to calculate it's purely about whether you spot this move or not right calculation ends after the first move beautiful example and for many players this move is not an option at all right so again even with these examples we actually understand how chess tactics work in general and actually as it's usually the case it looks like it doesn't matter this alignment because there are so many pieces in between correct it's just this pawn on g7 the pawn on g2 what are you talking about you're talking about the alignment on the g file i don't see any alignment you might say because there are so many blockages along the way how can that be relevant and this line is showing us the short line is showing us in fact that's very relevant right that's very relevant those pawns disappear and you get what you want this will be your homework position folks Bagirov versus Kolmov, a chess classic. They took on e1 to begin with. And here comes my question to you. Black to play. Please take a stock. Black is a beautiful resource in this position that wins the game. But don't shy away. Analyze further. Make sure. Maybe I'm tricking you, right? Just make sure that everything is working for black in those lines. And this will be a great consolation exercise of what we have seen in today's episode. As I said, folks, to my mind, the conclusions are like this. Candidate move generation is a core part of chess calculation. We need to see lots of different patterns to generate options for ourselves. And this book has that promise. It really, really tests us to enlarge our vision and come up with some idea that was just beyond our radar, basically. So this way, we also start considering insane looking ideas in some positions. But even so, right, we are breaking it down to its core for example we'll see how alignment was a huge issue when it comes to tactical ideas and vision how loose pieces for example how generating a couple of threats double attacks and so on 
was the underlying skill behind those moves or even Maroxi's example right how you, how the attempt of stopping the opponent's move rook h3 was guiding this decision of queen h5 and so on obviously as a human there are certain limitations in our cognitive system in terms of our biases but also in terms of visual system and obviously retreating moves are generally more difficult to spot than forward moves horizontal moves more difficult to spot than vertical ones and so on there are so many nice geometrical discussions as well that I also want to hear your opinion about this. Are there certain aspects of chess moves that are particularly difficult for you to spot? It can be a quiet move, it can be a backward move, it can be, yeah, it can be missing an alignment, for example, as we saw in this episode. Are there certain blind spots that you noticed while you were looking at your own mistakes and so on? And can we get better at this aspect of chess by generating several options, several kind of moves, and looking at those invisible ideas for further information about candidate moves by the way folks please check my chessable course fundamental chess calculation skills there is a separate chapter on the candidate move generation most mistakes in chess happen on the very first move where people don't give themselves enough choices and hopefully after studying those books and my courses this process will improve and you will spot those beautiful and invisible moves that you can tell to your grandchildren thank you so much